All right, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, today uh, we have Sophia uh, in the, for the fourth uh, race online seminar of 2021. Uh, she will uh, present us uh, personalized machine learning. Sophia, you're good to go. Thank you, Jarvis. Um, as you may know by now, I am Sophia. I'm working at AUTH along with Professor Athena Vakali. Today, I'm going to talk about how one size does not fit all. And in other words, I'm going to talk about personalized machine learning. Okay, so you might be wondering, okay, because machine learning is supposed to be personalized by default. So what is this personalized machine learning? That's why I would like to start with a story. Uh, before telling you more about personalized machine learning, I want to tell, to tell you a story about a paper I read about a month ago that brought my attention to the domain. In this paper, Rudovic and his colleagues explored the potential of robot-assisted autism therapy. He partnered with autism experts in Serbia and Japan and explored whether incorporating a robot into the therapy sessions of autistic children could enhance their engagement levels to the therapy. During the session, he collected visual and audio data through the robot, as well as physiological data from a wearable device that the child was wearing. He then combined this multimodal data, the audio, the visual, and the physiological data, to evaluate the levels of violence and arousal, as well as infer the engagement level of a child in real time through pre-trained deep learning models. Finally, based on these inferences about the child's engagement with the therapy, the robot could interact with the child in different ways to get back attention that might have been lost. I would like to make here a small note on balance and arousal. Uh, essentially, affective experiences are best described in two dimensions, balance and arousal. Balance describes how positive or negative an event word or emotion is. For example, uh, happy is a positive emotion, hence it lies on the, uh, on the right side of the balance axis, whilst frustrated is a negative emotion, hence it lies on the left side. On the y-axis, uh, arousal reflects whether an event or emotion is agitating and, uh, and exciting or calming and soothing. For instance, being delighted reveals more excitement compared to being calm. That's why they that's why they lie on different sides of the arousal axis while they are both positive emotions. So how do these things lead to personalized machine learning? In this work that I just described, the researchers noticed that when you apply dimensionality reduction techniques and specifically TSNE to an autoencoded uh, feature vector extracted from the multimodal data for each child, then the data representations that you get for each, style, uh, for each child, which are here depicted in different colors, uh, were quite different from each other. Notice how the representation of child number one, uh, which is from Japan, is significantly, significantly different from the representation of child number 23, which comes from the from Serbia in the, this reducted space. On top of that, similarly, if we dig deeper on the differences between these two children, as well as the differences between each individual child and the whole population, let's say all the children in the experiment, we will notice that the joint distributions of balance and arousal uh, are much different both between the children. So child one and child 23 have different distributions with each other when it comes to their affect, as well as between the children themselves and the population. So if you compare the first column with refers to the distributions of balance and arousal for the whole population of children and compare them to the column of child one or the column of child 23, you will see that these distributions are quite different. And hence training a generic model on the whole population, um, namely the first column, might not perform equally as well for the individual children whose distributions are quite different. That is how, let's say, this whole domain of personalized machine learning came to the attention of the research community. The research community noticed a problem with traditional machine learning. 
So how we all know it is that we get data from the general population. Then based on this data, we train a genetic machine learning or deep learning model. And then based on this model, we predict for a new user. Generic models are tuned to an average target population, and this might be quite acceptable in some research in some research and domains, such as marketing research. I'm sorry, such as marketing research. But what about health and well-being? Which uh, in which domains each individual is quite different from one another? Each individual's health is quite unique, and each individual's, uh, let's say, personality uh, is. A, again, quite unique. In these domains, good performance doesn't necessarily translate to each individual. So if the model is performing well to the gener general population, it doesn't mean that it will perform well for all the individuals. But is this acceptable when it comes to domains such as health? That is uh, where personalized machine learning comes in. Essentially, what is personalized machine learning? Personalized machine learning is when you get the data from new user, from a new user, and you try to train the mod a personalized machine learning or deep learning model based on this data in order to predict um, maybe physical activity or the mood or the health condition for the same user. Here, a question that pops into mind is, okay, what about a new user? You don't have data for a new user to train a whole deep learning model. That is why in many cases, uh, the data from the general population or a cluster that, it, that contains users, which are similar to our user, could be utilized as well to facilitate the training of a personalized model, essentially creating a hybrid model. The advantages of personalized machine learning, according to the uh, according to related literature, is generally better performance than generic models for the majority of the individuals, according to a wide range of literature. Uh, literature. Note here that this doesn't mean that personalized machine learning models perform the best for all individuals, but for the majority of the individuals, they tend to have better performance than generic models in the domain of health and well-being. At the same time, personalized machine learning models have the potential to enable privacy preserving machine learning solution. Uh, why is that? While this is not my domain, it comes quite natural to think that if you have a model trained on a single person's data, then you, which can also be trained on device, then you do not need to transfer data potentially to different servers uh, outside of the country, or let's say share data between different users in order to train different machine learning models. At the same time, it has the potential to decrease bias in machine learning models for minority populations. You might have heard many times about how machine learning models can be biased, again, biased against, against certain populations, for example, uh, African-Americans. And that is why mostly these models are trained uh, with the majority population's data or potentially with biased data sets. However, if you train the model with a single user's data, then potentially it has the ability to overcome this bias because this model is exactly targeted to the specific user. For all the reasons above, this topic is a novel active research topic with, topic with uh, growing interest from the scientific community, uh, both from major institutions, for example, the MIT Media Lab, is actively working on it, as well as companies such as Empatica Wearables, which utilize personalized machine learning models in their devices. Now, before we dig deeper into the literature of personalized machine learning, I want to briefly mention some concepts that will come in handy during the presentation. Of course, this is just a brief introduction, and, by, and this is by no means a complete overview of the concept. Firstly, deep learning is not surprisingly state of the art in the personalized machine learning literature in the health and well being domain. Specifically, there are certain types of neural networks that we encounter often in the literature, starting by traditional deep feed forward networks, which essentially try to approximate a function, a function that maps the input data, for example, the wearables accelerometer signal, to an output signal, uh, an output variable, let's say the user's performed activity. So they're looking for a function that maps the accelerometer data to the user's performed activity. 
However, these networks do not incorporate the temporal relationships between data points, which are very crucial when it comes to time series data. And wearable data are most of the time time series data. So as they do not share features learned across different positions of the sequences. And here is where sequence modeling comes in. The most basic type of sequence neural network is the recurrent neural network. A recurrent neural network, instead of mapping inputs to outputs alone, uh, maps is able to learn a mapping function for the inputs over time to a specific output, where it explicitly takes into account uh, the temporal relationship of points. However, RNNs have proven to be not so successful when it comes to long-term long -term dependencies. In other words, they cannot really learn well from data points that go far back in time. To solve these problems, there are two different types of neural networks proposed, namely the long short term memory uh, units, LSTM, and the gate recurrent units, GRUs. These two types incorporate some sort of memory, if you wish, that has the ability to remember as well to forget, and thus can better handle long-term dependencies. Um, to that extent, they usually offer better performance than RNNs even in the domain of personalized machine learning for well-being. Finally, another type of network that we sometimes meet in the literature of personalized machine learning is the encoder-decoder networks, and specifically the autoencoder auto network uh, per se. Such networks comprise of two components, the encoder component, which maps some input data into a lower dimensional re representation. And then there is a decoder component, which takes this lower dimensional representation and tries to reconstruct the original signal from this representation by minimizing the reconstruction loss. In the personalized machine learning domain, these networks are usually used for feature generation due to their dimensionality reduction capabilities, as well as their sequence-to-sequence -sequence model capabilities. Another concept that is quite hot, let's say, in the personalized machine learning domain is multitask learning. Now, multitask learning is a special type of transfer learning. The most common type of transfer learning that you might have heard is fine tuning. Essentially, in fine tuning, you utilize the initial layers of a pre trained model, which you have trained on task A, let's say cut recognition, to make predictions in a different task, task B, let's say animal recognition. And by freezing or utilizing these initial layers, you only need to train some additional final layers to adapt the network to your new task, recognizing animals. The target of transfer learning fine tuning is the minimization of the objective function of the target task only. So you are not trying to optimize the cat recognition problem, you're trying of task A, you're trying to optimize the animal recognition problem, task B your target task. On the other hand, the multitask learning is quite different uh, because all tasks are trained st simultaneously. Uh, so the knowledge essentially is not transferred after the training, so from task A to task B, but is, a, is transferred during the training from task to task. Each task uh, has some task specific layers that you can see also in the image. So task one has ta some task specific layers, task two has ta some task specific layers, but they all share as well some shared layers. And this is where the knowledge is being transferred. You can think of tasks as different emotions potentially in an emotion recognition problem or as different user clusters or even different users when it comes to personalized machine learning. Usually in personalized machine learning, each task is an individual user. So when do you normally use multitask learning? You usually use multitask learning if you would benefit from shared low level features. What would this mean? If you have to predict uh, two uh, outcomes, let's say positive emotion, um, potentially let's say, anger and then happiness and you want them to predict you want to predict them from a range of from 1 to 100 then you can assume that let's say these emotions share some low level features potentially the time the time of the day and the day of the week that these emotions appear 
or maybe there temporal some temporal relationships and you would like when you train the model to take advantage of all the data that refer both to the anger emotion and the happiness emotion and let's say share some features uh, for all in a multitask learning model at the same time you can use multitask learning if you have similar amounts of data for its task normally in transfer learning and fine tuning you have a lot of data for task the source task task a let's say cut recognition and you have relatively few data for the second task that is why in fine tuning you utilize a pre-trained model from the source task in order to let's say ad adapt it to the new task however in multitask learning this is different because normally the amounts of data you have for each task are quite similar. So the amounts of data you have on each individual person are quite similar in a multitask learning model. Uh, at the same time, you use a multitask learning model if you can train a big enough neural network to do well on all tasks. So if, as, like with generally with deep learning problems, if you don't have enough of data to train a big enough neural network, then you don't really bother to use deep learning. Um, finally, if you have absent labels uh, for specific tasks or specific users, let's say, multitask learning have proven to be quite successful with sparsely, sparsely labeled data. So, in order to better explain personalized machine learning, we'll focus on personalized machine learning for mental well-being. Why we're doing that? This is not exactly my research focus, however, it has been quite um, active research focus, if I may, and there have been many of papers published in this specific domain. So it's easier for me to explain the concepts around personalized machine learning and understand the state of the art. What is uh, personalized machine learning for mental well-being or what is machine learning for mental well-being in general is when you train models to predict the user's mood, emotion, stress level, depression level, or anything that's related to the user's effect. As you can see, for instance, in the screen, a user essentially is labeling their mood, so uh, their emotions, how they're feeling, happy, excited, sad, angry. And then maybe you train a model to predict uh, the mood of the user for tomorrow. Where it all started? Generally, personalized machine learning and mood inference started, as far as I know, in the mood scope study in 2013, where the goal of the study was to infer a user's mood based on smartphone usage patterns. So what they did, what they did is they used multilinear regression and they trained three different models. They trained the model, a personalized model, uh, utilizing only a single user's data. They trained a generic model utilizing all users data and they trained also hybrid models which utilize both per, um, the personal data of the user as well as the population's data. What they did notice uh, when they were measuring accuracy, unfortunately the area under the care was not reported, is that the generic models performed uh, around 66 percent in predicting the user's mood for tomorrow while the personalized models had the ability to perform up to 99 percent. Now, seeing this 99%, two things might come in mind. Uh, first of all, is that you might not, you have to notice that this 99% comes with, if you look at the diagram, after two months of training days. So essentially, you have to wait for a user to label for two months in order to reach this 99%, which is not very realistic. At the same time, um, this 99% seems a lot like overfitting. And this indeed might be the case, and it has been a problem that has been explored in personalized machine learning. Namely, when do we have enough, enough data to train a network based on a single user's data, but also when do we have to stop so that our problem, that, so that our model does not overfit to this individual uh, individual's training data. As you, as you saw before, they utilized um, a linear regression model in order to model the mood of the user over time. And around 2007 was the first paper that utilized deep learning models uh, in order to predict the user's mood. Specifically, their goal, uh, the goal of Suhar et al in the deep mood study was to 
to forecast the depression symptoms based on self-reports. So let's say for two weeks, um, I'm putting a score of one to between one and 100 of how depressed I feel. And then the model can predict how likely I am to have depression based on these self-reports. What they did is they utilized an RNN with hidden LSTM units. If you remember before, uh, RNN with LSTM units falls under the sequence modeling. So they did take advantage of the temporal dependencies. And they uh, and their evaluation showed uh, their evaluation showed the uh, uh, area under the CARE score of 88% for approximately for the genetic model. However, they did not try to explore the personalized machine learning scenario. In, and then comes the question, okay, what if we combine personalized machine learning and deep learning? And this is what we, are, we will try to explore today through three different papers. The first paper that we will explore comes from 2017 and is entitled Predicting Tomorrow's Mood, Health and Stress Level Using Personalized Multitask Learning and Domain Adaptation. Essentially, the goal of the paper was to forecast a person's mood from passively collected data, either from wearables or smartphones, and some self-reported labels of mood. The contributions, according to the paper, was that they utilized a multitask forward feed deep neural network for the first time in personalized machine learning for forecasting a person's mood. At the same time, they do forecasting and not just detecting a person, person's mood. So they don't just detect your mood for today, but they actually forecast your mood for tomorrow. Then they treat mood as a regression problem rather than a binary problem. This means that the, your mood is not just good or bad, but it ranges from one to 100, let's say, and it's a continuum. And finally, they do offer a considerable performance boost according to the results for the mood prediction problem compared to previous work. So how do they do it? First of all, they utilized manually designed features which refer to physiology, so skin conductance, temperature, and accelerometer data from wearables and mobile phones, the location of the user through GPS coordinates, phone usage, surveys, weather, including sunlight, temperature, and barometric pressure, et cetera. And finally, of course, mood labels in uh, one to 100 range. They utilized a multitask, a multitask neural network in order to predict the mood. And each task was defined as an individual person. As you can see, the green task, let's say, refers to person A, the blue task refers to person B, and the gray task refers to person C. However, um, even though the colored layers are the task-specific layers, you can also see that they have some quite shared layers that share knowledge for all users. Essentially, how do you, the question is now, how do you train a network like that? In order to train a network for a personalized machine learning uh, problem, where each task refers to a single person, then you have to use a mini batch in the training process, in the training iteration, which consists of a single person's data. So think of it as in the first iteration, you take the green person's data and you feed them, you feed them into the model. This data will not only affect the green person, but they will also affect the blue and gray person through the shared layers. And the er because the errors are essentially backpropagated to up update both the shared and the task specific layers weights. In that way, they managed to utilize both the populations and the individual person's data in a single prediction task. So according to the results, if you compare the personalized machine learning model that they, that this multitask neural network that they developed with a, with a traditional neural network, you provide a statistically significant better performance when it comes to mean absolute error, my, for all target labels. Here, the target labels were mood, stress, and health. And as you can see in the last row, all numbers are bold, which means from the paper that they had the p-value lower than 0 0.05, which essentially shows a statistically significant result, performance result, over the traditional neural network, which is the second line. However, this paper had some considerable limitations. First of all, first of all it suffered from the cold start problem. If you had a new user 
let's say a red user, there is no way to incorporate this new user into this already trained multitask neural network, because that would mean you need to add a new task. And in order to add a new task, you would need to retrain the network. However, what they did suggest is that you could potentially feed the new user's data through all the outputs, let's say for all users, and then average the results for all users. So let's say feed the red user's data um, into the from here, here, and here, and then average the result. And this performance, let's say, would be somehow similar to the generic model's performance. Uh, however, this was not tested. Uh, nevertheless, this paper suffered from the cold start problem. At the same time, they had a relatively small data sample of 69 users, high label requirements. They needed at least 15 days of data, label data, in order to train a personalized model. There was no sequence modeling. So as you might have heard, their model was a feed-forward deep neural network. Uh, there was no sequence modeling, no RNN or LSTM uh, networks. And then there was uh, manual feature design. There was no source, um, no, there was no automated feature engineering explored, which might or might not improve performance. And finally, it had the inability to predict far into the future. It could only predict one day in advance. So what's your mood gonna be tomorrow? While it might be useful, it might have been useful to predict what your mood gonna be in like 15, 14 days. This leads us to the second paper of the same year, which is kind of an extension to the first one, if I may. Uh, it's entitled Personalized Multitask Learning for Predicting Tomorrow's Mood, Health, and Stress. Essentially, it comes from the same research group and that you will notice quite soon. The goal is again to forecast the person's mood from possibly collected data and self-reported labels. And the contributions are quite similar to the previous one. But here there is a difference. They do try to handle the code start problem by utilizing user clustering. So essentially, if you can uh, put your user, your new user into a cluster, you need zero labels in order to incorporate new users into your model. We will see later how they do the user clustering, uh, what do they mean by it. But the contribution they give by that is that you essentially don't need any mood labels for the new users. And then in, indeed, they do forecast instead of detection, forecasting instead of detection, and they provide against, again, a performance boost compared to the traditional approaches, which we will go over later. The features like, are identical to the previous uh, research because they come from the same data set. Uh, but here, a task is defined differently. Instead of a task being a single user, a task is a group of users, a cluster of users based on their personality. So let's say the green cluster might be introverts, the blue cluster might be extroverts, and the gray cluster might be easily agitated users. That's quite random right now. And um, in this case, when you, train it, when you train this network in a training iteration, you don't use a mini batch consisting only of a single user's data, but you can utilize inside a mini batch a single cluster's data. So essentially, you can use multiple user's data for a single mini uh, for a single iteration, training iteration, as long as they belong to the same cluster. The errors are again that propagated to update both the shared and task specific cluster specific layers weights. Here, the personalized multitask learning neural network provided an area under the care, the rock care performance of 78% for mood prediction compared to a 65% for a generic neural network. If you remember from previously, a generic, let's say, neural network for mood prediction would give a performance of 66%. Uh, uh, however, this paper also has some limitations. While they claim to have solved the cold start problem, again, the users need to complete a survey, a personality questionnaire, personality scale, in order to be assigned into a cluster. However, this is not extremely realistic because in a commercial system, you don't normally ask your users to complete a 20 item scale before they log in. And then the target variable, the mood, for instance, is 
um, defined as a binary, so positive and negative, and not as a regression problem, as a range. Um, and on top of that, they do a removal of the most ambiguous users. So for these users that um, report an ambiguous mood, like around, let's say, from a scale to 1 to 100, they report a mood of 50 or 60, so they're not so sure. They don't really utilize those users or those labels because they do not know if they should be assigned to positive mood or negative mood. So they remove approximately 20% of the ambiguous labels. They, According to them, normally this is uh, done in research and they do remove even 40% of the ambiguous labels. So 20% is an improvement, but still, in removing 20% of the most difficult users to predict. I'm not so sure, I'm not exactly sure, um, let's say how worse your performance would be if you actually incorporated those users. Again, they have a relatively small data sample. Uh, they don't use sequence modeling um, or automated feature engineering, and they have an inability to predict far into the future. They only predict one day in advance. So these limitations that we discussed from the first two papers of personalized machine learning um, brings us to the third paper that we'll briefly see today. And this is a sequence multitask learning to forecast mental well-being from sparse self-reporting data. This paper does not, exact, does not exactly do personalized machine learning. It develops generic models, but it does utilize sequence modeling, and that is why I would like to see an alternative to the classic deep neural networks, feed-forward neural networks, and see how well it performs. The goal of this paper was to forecast a person's future sequences of moods, so not just one day in advance, um, but uh, multiple days in advance from passively collected data, uh, coming from wearables, as well as sparse self-reported labels of mood. The contributions of the paper is that it predicts multiple steps ahead, not just the next day, but potentially the next week. It does utilize multitask learning, but notice here that each task is not a single user, so it's not personalized as in learning. Each task is a different dimension of mood, namely valence or arousal. It does utilize sequence modeling through LSTM units, as well as automated feature extraction through sequence to sequence uh, encoder decoder models. And it does offer a performance boost over the single task alternative, as well as traditional ML approaches without utilizing deep learning. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, so let's see how they do it. In this model, a task is not defined as a single user or a user cluster, but rather as a dimension of effect, balance or arousal, as we saw them previously. A training iteration is described in the picture that you see on your left. Uh, its input, let's say a week or two weeks of training data, is passed through an LSTM laser, which operates as the encoder. The LSTM encoder layer then outputs a fixed length representation with the size of the prediction. What does this mean? This means that it gets two weeks of data uh, in, as an input. And let's say you want to output a two days prediction. You want to see how the user will be feeling for the next two days. Then the encoder layer will output a lower dimensional representation of the two weeks input into a two day representation of the input. Then this two-day representation will go through another LSTM decoder layer in order to reconstruct the original two days future of the future sequence. So you want to set, you want to see how close is let's say the encoder output to the actual two days that should have normally been predicted, and that's how an encoder decoder layer works normally as well in machine translation. Let's say in machine translation. So uh, let's, in the evaluation of this model, they notice that the multitask learning models uh, offer statistically significant performance boost in predicting both balance and arousal over the naive baselines, namely the um, support vector regressor and the gradient boosting regressor GBR. Um, essentially, if you trained, let's say, one model to predict arousal and one model to predict balance, this model, the multitask learning model, uh, that predicts both at the same time, 
had a statistically significant performance boost compared to the single task alternatives. At the same time, they noticed that three weeks of data offer the most uh, of late sparsely labeled data offer the best performance, while uh, the error increases the more days in the future we are trying to predict. So if you want to predict one day ahead, the error is quite low. If you want to predict one week ahead, the error increases. The limitations of this work, as far as I'm concerned, is that there is a lack of the exploration of the personalization benef uh, benefits. So if you utilize personalized machine learning, would you get any extra benefit? So it's potentially more like a future work direction. And then there is a lack of good baselines. They do not really offer comparisons with previous works. Let's say previous work that utilized personalized machine learning, they, off, they only offer comparison with traditional machine learning approaches, such as the support vector regressor and the gradient boosting regressor. And at the same time, uh, they do have increased label requirements, given that the best results were achieved after three weeks of labeled data. Now, um, given this brief overview of these three papers that are, I would say, quite similar to the state of the art right now, they represent quite well the state of the art, I drafted a list of potential future directions that I see personalized machine learning is going. Uh, personalized machine learning um, has been explored quite intensely with feed-forward deep neural networks, but we still haven't seen any sequence modeling when it comes to it. So could some sequence modeling offer a performance boost compared to the traditional deep learning alternative alternatives? Then there, is no, there has been no exploration when it comes to personalized machine learning and whether or not it can, let's say, fight algorithmic bias. Can we do better prediction for minority population utilizing personalized machine learning, or is it just a wrong assumption? Does it, does it incorporate the same amount of bias? Naturally, you would think that it could indeed be a solution to algorithmic bias. Um, then there is like um, potential in the privacy preserving personalized machine learning. For people working on privacy, I do believe that personalized machine learning could offer some opportunities to offer like privacy preserving solutions. Then uh, there is the cold start problem, uh, especially when it comes to multitask learning. So it would be interesting to, in, to research ways on how you could find the fight, the cold start problem in multitask learning uh, problems. Then because we're working with deep learning again, most of the time, and sur not surprisingly, it's a state of the art in personalized machine learning you have the issue of interpretability, especially in the domain of health and well-being. If you are going to make a prediction of someone's health, you really need it to be interpret interpretable. You cannot really give a black box. And that leads me to the next point, which is quantifying uncertainty. Uh, Van Jus and Deba have been talking about it in, uh, like I think, in their presentations. Uh, which I think goes quite well, especially in the domain of uh, healthy health and well-being. And then it would be quite interesting to actually explore different subdomains within the health and well-being domain. Uh, you've noticed I talked only about, about mood prediction, and that's why that's because the focus of personalized machine, lear machine learning research has been on mood prediction. However, there are topics such as uh, sleep stages detection, activity, activity, activity prediction, activity recognition, or physical activity prediction and forecasting that uh, have not been explored yet. And finally, even though we are talking about a model that's by default personalized and refers to a single person's behavior, um, a single person's behavior is not static, it's dynamic, it can change over time. So it's quite interesting to explore the junction, uh, the junction between the person between personalized machine learning and concept drift adaptation. Concept drift is essentially what I described before: the change in an individual's behavior or distribution of the data, uh, which could be learned to utilize online learning approaches. <clears throat> 
Finally, I would like to close this presentation uh, by saying that in the domain of health and well-being, personalized machine learning can offer a significant performance boost according to various uh, papers and various studies. Deep neural networks are currently the state of the art in personalized machine learning, but um, we need more exploration in terms of sequence modeling and interpretability. Multitask learning and transfer learning have been indeed proposed as a solution to the cold start problem for new users. But as you see, there is still room for improvement when it comes to the cold start problem. And finally, personalized machine learning does offer a lot of possibilities for exploration in terms of privacy preservation, uncertainty estimation, and algorithmic bias. And these sort of topics have not been discussed in, let's say, in, collaborate, in collaboration with personalized machine learning approaches. This is the literature I utilized for my presentation, our beneficiaries and partners for the RISE Consortium, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sophia. It was a very interesting presentation. Uh, do we have any questions from the participants? I have a question. Uh, thanks a lot, Sophia. Very nice presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask about the, the data self used in this personalized machine learning because when you use uh, when you have to collect a lot of uh, personal data, you will make sure that you have a lot of variability there. But uh, what do you do with the bias present in the personal data? Uh, is there any way around that? Um, so far, as far as I've seen in the papers, I haven't really seen any approach that explores whether or not bias plays a role in the, in the person, like bias in personal data plays a role in the performance of personalized machine learning models. It could be potentially a future work direction. So far, I haven't seen anything related to it, and it might be a very interesting point that you're raising that is worth attention. Okay, yeah, because uh, <clears throat> when I was thinking is that uh, when you have like uh, not personalized but generic uh, machine learning is that the bias itself is suppressed by introducing a lot of different individuals. But when you restrict yourself to, to like a, a bit more narrow domain, then there is some bias probably that persists throughout the data set that has to be like Okay, now that I better understand the question actually, and I think a little bit more in, in multiple papers, okay, apart from the fact that they do mention overfitting as a problem of um, personalized machine learning models, they do mention that they somehow manage to handle bias uh, through heavy regularization of the models uh, to regularization, dropout layers, etc. But they do not specifically mention let's say, if these methods are eff effective in fighting bias in these models, or they assume, let's say, that by utilizing regularization methods, that the bias is somehow suppressed. But uh, that's the most I've seen, I think, in the papers. Okay, but uh, I'm sorry, just to understand that, uh, is it like uh, they're trying to like, uh suppress the bias present in the method or in the data by having a regularization on, during the training process? I do believe in the, um, the bias in the model, but uh, mm. be 100%. I don't 100% get the difference between the two right now. Okay, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I'm intrigued now to know. Uh, we can take this conversation mm -hmm. actually uh, also outside the seminar. It's very sure. interesting. It would potentially lead to future work directions that I haven't thought of. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, also, uh, I mean, I have a small comment uh, uh, about uh, about uh, Van Kuch, uh, question. Have you thought uh, or have you seen anyone trying to handle this bias through adversarial training? So mm -hmm. you will have personalized, personalized still machine learning. But uh, I mean, if you explore the adversarial uh, paced models, that might be interesting to be more resilient to the bias introduced by the uh, by, uh, by 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 persons by local training. 
so far from the literature I've studied, which of course is not limited to these papers that I presented, I haven't seen any use of adversarial, adversarial models. So again, I really love all these questions because I'm also new to the domain, I'm learning about it. And that's why I wanted to present it to you because I'm pretty sure um, such a growing domain could possibly say a lot of open question, future directions, etc. But so far I haven't seen any adversarial networks being used. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes, of course, Thomas. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, about uh, this uh, bias problem uh, that uh, Vanjush and Ahmed mentioned, uh, I honestly don't, I'm not sure I completely understand it in a sense that I think that the goal of personalized machine learning is training on a single person. Whereas normally bias is a problem because you want your machine learning model to be general, like to represent, to be as generic as possible. But I fail to see like uh, how bias is a problem in a model that uh, is meant to fit uh, uh, precisely one, uh, one user and not like other users. Um, I think that when Bantus was referring to bias, correct me if I'm wrong here, Bantus, uh, he was re not referring to the stereotypical bias that we have in mind. So not so much as the bias that is introduced by sexism or racism or this sort of bias, but more like algorithmic bias, like the various bias, variance bias problem of massive learning models. I, I think that even though they have the same name, they they are quite distinct, but you can encounter both in machine learning problems, but I do believe he was referring to that. I did answer for this at least. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, what I was thinking out loud was the bias variance problem in personalized data that uh, maybe you don't have sufficient uh, variance when you collect the data set in a single individual to suppress the bias in the data. And as a result of that, uh, maybe some problem with uh, having good generalization problem when you are training because your data even though you have a good model there is not sufficient uh, sufficient uh, variance in the data to like uh, generalize even at a single individual but that's something that uh, i'm not like entirely sure i was just thinking out loud and has to i have to like give a bit more thoughts on that and why I thought about this, this is because on non-personalized data set, uh, you make sure that uh, the bias is not there because uh, the individual are different. Namely, they are uh, IID data set. And that's the assumption that you are making anytime you, you are doing some uh, training data because uh, when you use, uh, when you do shuffling of the data and there is no ordering and the ordering is totally random, and that means that uh, data coming from different individuals are independent from one another and as well, hopefully identically distributed. But when you have data set coming from a single individual, that assumption is not, I don't see it how it can hold. And in that sense, I have to give it a bit more thoughts on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, now, now I understood what uh, what the problem was about. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Any more questions? Um, I also have a question. Uh, moving away from the interesting discussion on on uh, bias and variance, so uh, you showed us uh, examples from the literature in which uh, we are. Uh, instead of personalizing the entire model, we are keeping a part of the model fixed and personalizing some layers of the model towards certain users. And uh, what I was thinking, honestly, and I'm actually surprised to see this type of solution uh, compared to, an, to, to another. So what I was thinking is, uh, is there any literature that instead tries to have a single global uh, model but instead of passing just the input data as the input, you could try to pass two inputs to the model. One is your input data, and the other is a representation of the user. So instead of having different output layers, you would have the model use the two inputs, so put together input data and what we know about this user to perform the prediction. And then, of course, 
this representation is user embedding would be the part that you go to do personalized training on. So are there uh, techniques that do this in the literature? So essentially you are talking about um, differentiating in the input layers by using, let's say, a user embedding. Um, so like for instance, an autoencoder to embed the user in a in a different like vector, a different lower dimensional space, for instance, and then input that in the model somehow or um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Something similar to that. So uh, basically the, the way you from the output you back propagate through all the layers of the model, you would also back propagate to the embedding layer. And depending on which input data you put in, you would uh, change only the embedding of that specific user in this the training iteration. So each user would have his own embedding. And this could also solve the cold start problem, meaning that if you have some basic knowledge about a user, for example, age, uh, sex, location, you could uh, give him a base embedding, which is uh, basically average from the embedding of similar people. And then the user could, uh, um, and then the model could be trained over time to actually starting from there, uh, make it more personalized to the specific user. So basically being on the input side rather than the output side, yeah, the personalization. Mm, to be honest, in the papers I've read, and I cannot say that for sure there nothing exists out there that does that, uh, but from the papers I've read, the only thing that comes closer to what you're describing, I think is mm, the, this model that I'm actually having on the screen right now, that let's say alters the representations that are coming through the uh, through this encoder decoder layer essentially alters the representations of a single user like the input um, but i am again this is not this was not personalized machine learning this was just a simple uh, encoder decoder architecture uh, sequence sequence architecture mm, i haven't seen what you're describing i think in personalized machine learning uh, model uh, again that could be interesting the thing is this domain of course it has some papers surrounding uh, around it but it first appeared let's say okay not 2013 but that was pretty let's say basic it started really as a um, having more scientific interest in 2017 2018 so it's quite new and the models that you see are yeah limited let's say could be interesting as well. Uh, there, there might be some, let's say, low hanging fruits uh, coming from other areas that have not been integrated yet into this specific, uh, into this specific. Domain. Exactly. So that might be, yeah, very, very interesting. Thank you for the presentation, Sophia. Thank you, Ludovica. Uh, I also have a, a, another comment uh, on uh, what Ludovica suggested. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, what uh, I mean, uh, I think the idea uh, that Ludwig talked about could be also helpful for uh, for the cold start problem, because usually uh, when you work with uh, with embedding and you have a new node and you like we're talking about like a different from different domain, but if you have a new user in in this scenario and uh, you don't know much about the user, but still you can leverage the the uh, the relation that they have with other. Um, kind of uh, let's say information, okay, piece of information, and this information is more like a, a bit of a high level. So many users who are actually have been uh, have been there for a while uh, share this information. So when this guy comes in and he's new, you can actually rely on this information to have an initial embedding for this called uh, for this new user, and then you you are be able to start from a good place, and you can have uh, in a shorter time. Uh, a personalized, uh, a personalized prediction or like a personalized task for him. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, elaborate, if you can uh, exploit the context around this user or any user, like new users or old users, I think you may be able to uh, general, generalize better over the cold start problem. That's quite, uh, that's a very interesting comment, Ahmed. I think I would love to have a further discussion both with you and Ludovica on this aspect, the user embeddings and how they could be incorporated into personalized machine learning. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. I love uh, how guys you have so also different ideas about the expansion of the work. It's quite interesting. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, sure. You actually give a really interesting presentation. Uh, but I also have one one last question uh, about this about the multitask uh, about the multitask uh, learning. Uh, what uh, what are the problems or like the disadvantage that you see from rely from using this uh, multitask learning? Mm -hmm. Let me first clarify that I mostly worked or studied multitask learning in this domain so potentially i can refer to problems of multitask learning in this domain but potentially in a different domain they had find solutions for um, these problems for instance um, let's say in multitask learning as i've mentioned earlier if you uh, have each user uh, defined each task defined as a single user then you have the issue that if a new user comes, you have to retrain the whole model in order to optimize, let's say, the objective of the multitask learning model for all tasks. So all users plus the new one. Um, so in this domain, at least, they haven't mentioned how you can add the new task in your network without the need to retrain the whole network. Now, I do not know if, let's say, in the multitask learning literature, if there are some uh, research approaches that uh, have tried to solve this problem to, let's say, add new tasks to the network online, so incrementally, somehow incremental multitask learning. Um, so at least in my domain, I haven't seen it. In different domains, it might be the case. Um, yeah, I think from the, let me think a little bit extra. I haven't really noticed something else that would be a drawback icon of multitask learning in this specific case, apart from the cold start problem. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if you had, have you had any thoughts about the shortcomings that you would like to discuss? Uh, uh, yeah, actually, actually, my uh, it's not uh, like thoughts because uh, my question, I, I wasn't thinking much about uh, the cold start problem. Uh, it just... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, when you, you introduce the multitask learning, I could only think that one of the drawbacks or like, uh, not drawbacks, but it's something I need to consider if I'm applying this kind of, uh, of learning that the tasks are actually related, which is the case actually here. But if they are not related, then the back propagation will be uh, kind of fuzzy in the shared layers and you will not learn much about the other tasks. Yes, I understand the question. Now. Um... But one of the assumptions that you when you do use multitask learning when you do make the assumption that there is some similarity between the tasks so that they could benefit from some shared low feature representation however the only case um when i was reading and studying about multitask learning i've read that the only case that it could harm your performance is if you don't have enough of data to train it so even if they don't really share a lot of low level features. It wouldn't harm so much the performance, uh, according to the, let's say, sources that I read. Um, but it would just be as a generic uh, single task network. Um, now, I don't have the references of this uh, for this here, but I could maybe present you with a, the video, um, the course that I've done on multitask learning, uh, specifically in some video that discuss when to use it and which are the when not to use it. Maybe that would be interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. I was just trying to answer uh, uh, a specific question in my mind about this, uh, because uh, if you have the choice to do, uh, to learn some task using, well, to, to learn something using one task, one model and one objective uh, function, or you can do similar, or you can get the same result by doing multitask learning, uh, what would you go for? And you have all the all the conditions that you need for the multitask learning to work. Mm, I would go for the multitask learning because, uh, according to, again to the literature, they when you have tasks that uh, could benefit from low level feature representations, it generally performs better than single task alternatives. So, according to research in multiple domains, not just in the mood prediction does perform better than single task alternatives when the requirements are being met. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah. 
Interesting answer, actually. Uh, okay, thank you, Sophia, for uh, for your presentation. It was very, very interesting. Glad to like it. So, do we have any more questions? Okay, I think not. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much, Sophia, for the presentation. And thank you, everyone, for participating in uh, this uh, fourth online seminar for 2021. Uh, see you again in uh, three weeks.